Amen. Feel free to have a seat. Hey, we're about to welcome our guest speaker up here today, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit. He's got some resources that are here. There's a resource table that's right over there um, at our Next Steps area. I want to encourage you after the service to go there. There's some information about some upcoming events that he has, as well as his book, Next Level Motivation. And uh, he, they, they're doing a special deal today to bless everybody. Normally the book is $15, but they're selling it for $10 today. And I want to encourage you to go there and patronize them and help them. We want to bless the man of God for bringing the word of God to us today. Uh, you know this man, probably most of us from his exploits on the field, but I want to assure you that he is much more than that. He's been a very successful businessman, a successful motivational speaker, but I think he would take more pride in the fact that he's a husband and a father and a man of God. Would you do me a favor, Journey Church, and welcome Donovan Darius to the stage. Give him a warm Journey Church welcome. Thank you, Daddy. Amen. Amen. Thank, thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, you guys. Before we get going, okay, do me a favor. Stand back up. We're just going to have a quick word of prayer. I know they are. Uh, great job. Give it a round of applause for the wonderful worship team. <laughs> Let's just bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. Father, we are here because, Father, you grace us with the opportunity with life, breath, and strength. And so, Holy Spirit, we welcome you here today. We're not here for any person other than you. We're here that you may be glorified. We're here that we can receive a word from you. We pray as your son prayed, let your kingdom come on this earth as it is in heaven. Let us understand, learn, and apply and experience, oh God, those things that it takes for us to be successful here by living life according to your word. And so, Father, today use me. Oh, God, that I may speak into the hearts of your people. We thank you that you've already prepared the hearts and the minds and the souls of everyone that's here today. We thank you that angels are protecting the families that are here today. We thank you when they go home, they'll, they'll find things better than it was before they left. We thank you, Father God, that you're doing a great and wonderful thing in the lives of these men. We thank you, Father God, have you chosen us as fathers, as brothers, as sons, that we may walk out your purpose here on this earth. Use us mightily. Let your will be done. We give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Amen you guys. Well, how's everybody doing today? All right, all right. Again, so again, I'm Donovan Darius, pastor. I already kind of shared just a little bit of my journey. Yes, I was fortunate to play 10 years in the NFL. I'm, you know, presently, I work for the NFL as a life coach. I work with guys coming into the league. And I work with guys leaving the league. I work on developing strategy with them, helping them understand their journey, developing life plans for themselves. I also do that for organizations and corporations. I do motivational corporate speaking all around the country and across, you know, across the waters as well. Um, I do a lot of different things. I work for the NFL as also a director of the Legends community. That just basically means that my role when guys retire is to reach out to them, to embrace them, to help them celebrate their journey and then connect them with what they need to move life in life forward. As he said, I'm also a father, I'm a proud husband, I love my wife to life, okay? I love my children, I have I raised five children, my son's 25 years old, I have a 19-year-old daughter, okay, who runs uh, Alabama in track, I have a 17-year-old daughter who's basically a uh, senior in high school playing volleyball, I have a 15-year-old daughter who's a uh, basketball player, and I have an, I'm raising an eight-year-old daughter. And so how many fathers we have in here today? Amen. Amen. And so understanding this, uh, how many husbands do we have in here today? Amen. How many sons we got in here today? <laughs> we get out, we get hundred percent participation. But I ask that because I want to make sure I'm in the right room. I want to make sure because I truly believe that God has given a message that any and everybody in here that we all need. And as I speak it, God is speaking to me. And because here's what God does. At the right time, I heard, a, I heard a proverb a long time ago, it says, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And that just means when you're ready in your life for what God has for you, the answer is going to come. And so when you look at your life and you say, I don't have this and I don't have that or I need this, when you're ready, you're going to get all the information you need. But just like Pastor Eric said, it's not so much just about the information, it's about the application. You see, in life, there's five questions that everybody needs to answer. Five questions. 
Before you leave this earth, you're going to have to answer these questions. Number one is, who am I? That first question speaks to your identity. Who am I? You see, most people establish their identity based off of things that they have or things that they can do. Like, for example, I played in the NFL. One of the struggles that guys have when they transition from the NFL is they focus on understanding that I was a football player. I am a football player. Because when what you do becomes who you are, when you stop doing what you do, you can lose who you are, your identity. Some people establish themselves based off of the clubs or the groups or the networks that they're in. They say, hey, I'm a Republican, or hey, I'm a Democrat, or hey, I'm black, or hey, I'm white, hey, I'm this, hey, I'm that. Who are you? You see, if you establish your identity on anything other than what God says about you, than what your creator made you, and how he made you, and who he made you to become, then everything in life is going to fail. So the first thing you have to establish is, who am I? The next thing you got to establish is, where am I from? Where did I come from? You see, most people in life, they establish that, that, that question or they get the answer to that question based off of their heritage. Well, you know what? I came from Africa. Or you know what? I came from Camden, New Jersey. Or I came from this or I came from that. And by in and of itself, your family lineage is so limited. But when we understand where did I come from, I came from heaven. I was created by the, all, the greatest creator of the world, and he created me. So that means he has unlimited, unlimited resources. He's impacted me and empowered me with so many things and everything that I need that I come from a place where the resources never run dry. I come from a place, amen. I come from, I come from a place where I have constant 360 degrees 365 days, protection around me. That's where I come from. See, I don't come from the limited, see, I don't come from the limited places. Like, for example, I grew up in Camden, New Jersey. Camden, Camden New Jersey was ranked the number three most dangerous city in the, in the country. They said 80% of the people in, in Camden, New Jersey live below the poverty line. They said one out of every 50 people in Camden, New Jersey will be a part of a violent crime in their life. And one out of 27 people in Camden, New Jersey, will be part of some type of personal property crime. And so if I looked at my life and said, where am I from? I'm from Camden. Understanding that when I walked outside my house every morning and I saw gangs on one side, drug deals on the other side, and I looked around me for my hope in terms of this is where I'm from. If I looked at my circumstances... If you look at your circumstances, if you look just just your family, if you look to just a group or just where you're born or just where you're from and you don't understand that you were created and you, you're coming from a place of unlimited supply. You're coming from a place where God says, you are my masterpiece. You're coming from a place where he says, he says that, you know, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, neither has entered into the hearts of man what's in store for you. That's where you're coming from. And so until you answer that question, number one, who am I? Number two, where am I from? Number three, why am I here? My purpose. Why am I here? You see, one of the greatest tragedies in life is not death. One of the greatest tragedies in life is living life without a purpose or living life with the wrong priorities. There's somebody in here that may live in life without purpose. You're getting up in the morning, you're doing the same thing every morning. You're clocking in, but in your mind and in your heart, you're clocking out. Or you're walking through life with the wrong priorities. You're putting all your energy in just this. You're putting all your energy just in your job. You're putting all your energy in just your friendship. You're putting all your energy in this or that. Wrong priorities. And so until we understand what is our purpose, what is our purpose? Why are we here? Why did the creator make us? What did he intend? What was his original intent? And I'm going to share that as we go forward so you can answer those questions. But until you ask yourself and understand the answer to that question, why am I here? You'll always find yourself never maximize your potential. you always find yourself being frustrated. How many of you people in here know that there's more that you can do than you're doing right now? How many of you guys in here know that you know what, that there's something that you're here to do and you haven't yet accomplished it yet? Let me see your hands. 
And so understanding who am I? Where am I from? Why am I here? And the fourth question you got to answer is, what can I do? What is your potential? You see, most of us are limiting ourselves and our potential based off just what we see, based off just who we know, based off of what somebody has told us, or even worse cases, based off of what we didn't told ourselves. And so when we think about, when we answer that question or ask ourselves that question, what can I do? We think about how much money do I have in the bank? Well, God says, he'll supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. He says, when you seek forth, the, when you seek the kingdom of God, his ways of doing things and his righteousness, his right standing, then guess what he says? That everything you need, he'll give to you. So when you think about it, when you think about it, amen. When you think about it, he says, when you think about it, what can I do? Understand this, if I have a seed in my hand and I have a little apple seed, and if I ask you, what is in my hand? Most people will just look at it and say, oh, it's just a seed. It's just a seed. But do you understand that inside that seed, if I plant it, when I plant it, into soil, the good soil, the right soil, and when I give that little seed the water it needs, the encouragement it needs, the light that it needs, the sun, S-U-N-N-S-O-N, when I give that seed the sun that it needs, that little seed then sprouts up. That seed then continuously grows. That seed then turns into a whole apple farm, all from a little seed. Inside of you, God says, you are my greatest masterpiece. He says, I put myself inside of you. God has planted that seed of greatness inside of you. But most of us have just looked at the seed and defined their life just by what they can see. Because here's something I want you to understand. There's a passage in the Bible that I love, and it says, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, neither have entered into the hearts of men what God has planned for you. So I'm going to break it down a little bit more so it makes even more sense. The reason why God says eyes haven't seen is because our, natural, our eyes is a natural function of our sight. That means it's very limited. You know why they used to think the world was flat? Why? Because that's all they can see. There's somebody in here right now looking at their life situations, and all you can see brings you to a place of frustration. All you can see brings you to a place of fear. All you can see brings you to a place where you feel like you have no hope. But when God says, eyes haven't seen, the reason why, because guess what? God doesn't function just by our natural sight. The way God sees and the way God wants us to operate is he gives us a vision. And so what he does is he gives us a vision. He gives us the picture inside. And that's what he wants us to use to direct our lives, the vision. When it says that ears haven't heard what God has in store for you. The reason why, because guess what? Ears is a natural function of just our hearing. Well, see, we're in this room right now. And you can hear me here, but there could be another building right next to it. And they're telling you where there's a million dollars with your name on. There's a check and all you got to do is pick it up. But if you can't hear them because you're here and you're just trusting your natural hearing, then you'll never get a chance to, you'll never get a chance to benefit from the gift of that million dollars. You see, God doesn't function just off our natural hearing. He speaks to us in a still small voice. He speaks to us through our intuition and through our consciousness. You know what's right and wrong to do. You know when you should call somebody back. You know when you should turn the TV off. You know when you should turn the computer off. You know when you need to forgive. You know it because he's speaking to you. But what we hear, we have the voice of the world or we're just trusting our natural hearing to determine what we can do. And so when it says, neither is entered into the hearts of the men, here's what it means by there. He, because God, he puts things on the deep inside of you. The deep parts of the hearts of men is the mind of other people. The reason why people can't understand what God has put in the hearts of other people, because guess what? God gave you the gift. God gave you the vision. So you can't understand what God did, what God said to me. You, don't, may, you may not agree with what God has purposed for me to do. But what we do in life oftentimes is we wait for somebody else to validate what we do. We wait for somebody else to give us the accreditation on who we are and who God says we are. Inside, we're burning up because we know, man, I can see myself doing this. I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to be having this. I'm supposed, this is supposed to what it's supposed to look like. 
but I'm waiting for somebody else to check off the box. You see, in God's eyes, he says, eyes haven't seen because he gives you vision. Ears haven't heard because he speaks on the inside. He said, neither has entered into the hearts of other men. Why? Because he gave it to you. And so who am I? Why, where am I from? Why am I here? What can I do? And the last one, where am I going? Where is your, what is your vision for your life? God, is, God has, 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 uh, he has plainly spoken and showed to us that he has tremendous plans for us. And he says in our life that it's up to us to make the plans, but his purpose will prevail. So he's given something for us to do. And so when you answer that question, where am I going? I ask you, where are you going? Because if you ask yourself right now, based off your habits, you know where you're going. If every time you get stressed out and you drink, you know where you're going. You're going to alcoholism. If every time you get frustrated and you're having situations with your wife or you have a significant other, you know what I mean, then you turn, you turn to the computer and you turn to these books, guess what, you know where you're going. You're going into a situation where you're going to be in bondage. If you get into a situation every time because you wasn't raised how to have conflict resolution or how to talk out of your emotions and how to resolve situations, you want to holler, you want to run, you want to hit, you want to do all these things. If, if that's what you do, you know it. Then guess what? Pretty soon the cops may be calling, coming to your house. You know, it, just take, it, takes, it takes a lifetime to build up a life, but it takes one decision, one moment for us to waste it all. And we've all been a part of that, gentlemen. We all have that every day, 365 days a year. It comes down to one decision we make. So those five questions, who am I, where am I from, why am I here, what can I do, and where am I going? I'm going to share with you guys in the remaining time we have just some things, some lessons that I had to learn and that I'm still learning, that life has taught me about answering those questions. The first one is that we all have a journey. The first thing lesson that life has taught me is that we all have a journey. See, my journey started in Camden, New Jersey. Okay, my life journey on this earth started in Camden, New Jersey. Yours started somewhere. See, I have a number that's big to me, that means a lot to me, 1,320.7. 1,320.7. That number to me is the, is the distance of miles from Camden, New Jersey, to Syracuse, New York, where I went to, Scott, where I went to uh, college, to the Jacksonville Jaguars, 1,320.7. If I was to ask you to count up the mileage of from where you started to where you are now, it's going to be a lot of miles. And I'm sure in that journey, there were some ups. There were some downs. There were some times you felt like giving up. There were some times you overcame. But our life, our life is measured in that journey. And that's why I love so much even about the name of the church, Journey Church. Because it is, life is a journey. One of the things I also learned, I learned in my journey in, in growing up through humble beginnings is that in different times like this, life will call you and life will test you. I remember growing up, man, my mom, man, she, like I said, it was five of us, and she did a tremendous job of doing everything she can. But one of the things, as you guys probably know, is that you, can only, you can't burn your, your candle on two ends of the, you know, you can't burn on two, two ends of the candle. And my mom used to work so hard, and she used to do everything. And I remember being a child, man, I just wanted to grow up and help my mom. I just wanted to create a better situation for my mom and my family and those that I cared about. To the point that I remember I went to a coach one day, Coach Thomas, and I said, Coach, and I went to him crying because I said I got tired of being able to have to come home and click the light switch just to see if the electricity was working. I got tired of looking inside the refrigerator to see that we didn't really have any food at different times. I got tired of understanding that we had to walk everywhere because the car that we had was so unreliable. I wanted something to change. I wanted it to be something different. And I knew, and so what I learned when I looked at my journey, it, that it was those humble beginnings that really helped me. But it was something that my, Mr. Tom, Coach Thomas has said. He said, Donovan, whatever you put your mind to do, he said, whatever you put your mind to do and you commit to it wholeheartedly and you don't ever give up, that whatever it is you want, you can accomplish. Whatever it is you want, you can accomplish it. And see, that stuck with me. And when he said that to me, my life totally changed. Because at, the, at that moment, during my journey, at that moment, I realized that I was in control. Now, I was still 15. I was still young. But I just knew that I had something I had to do. And that this was a journey. And so I'll never forget, my journey led me to a point where you guys, again, you see that I was playing in the National Football League. But the journey brought me to that point. 
And so I remember it was April 18th, 1998. I was sitting in Delray, New Jersey. It was draft day. And right now, man, on draft day, man, they said, Donovan, you can go everywhere from the first round to the third round and not get drafted at all. I just had no idea. But it was on that day, it was on that day that I knew my life totally changed. You see, there are some moments that life will, there are some moments where life will going to draft you. Life is prepared and life is going to draft you. So on that draft day for me, I was sitting in the car in Delray, New Jersey in a white Jeep Cherokee. And so as I'm sitting in the car, I'm, I'm kind of getting away from everybody because it was a very stressful time. Think about it. At one moment, my life can totally change. And so as I'm sitting in the car, I'm feeling the weight of my family. I'm feeling the weight of this decision. I'm feeling the weight all through the, my journey of all the things I've been through at that moment. And so as I was sitting there, I decided, you know what, Dominic, let's just pray. I closed my eyes and I put a song on it. And the song was by Yolanda Adams. It was called, The Battle Is Not Yours, It Belongs to the Lord. And what that meant to me is that, Donovan, everything you've been through brought you up to this point. And that everything you'll go through, God is going to take you to the next chapters of your life. And so you might as well just put your hands up. You might as well trust, walk in faith, and know that this journey has a purpose. And so as I'm sitting in a white Jeep Cherokee and I got my eyes closed, out of nowhere I hear one of my brothers knock on the door or knock on the window. Boom, boom, boom. Donovan, Donovan, Jacksonville on the phone. I'm like, what? He said, Jacksonville's on the phone. And so what I did, man, I was jumped out of my car. My mom lived on a two-story apartment building. And upstairs inside the apartment building, it was like, a thousand, like 500 people inside a little, a little small little apartment. I don't know how, many, how, many, how, how we got that many people in there, but we did. And I got out the car, and I ran up to the top of the steps so fast. Matter of fact, if it was a 40-yard dash that day, man, I would have broke the record because I got out there so fast. But as I got to the top of the steps, as I got to the top of the steps, I saw the whole family. Just everybody in the family right there. And it was like a scene from the movie, you know, where, where Moses parts the Red Sea. Because the whole room just parted. And all I saw was on the other end was my mom holding up the phone. And I was like, wow, this is it. This is what, this is that moment. And so every step, with every step that I started to get to my mom, I started to remember the hard times. With every step, I started to think about the times I wanted to give up. With every step, I started thinking about the purpose of my journey. With every step I went, I started thinking about the opportunity that lies before me. And so when I got that phone with tears in her eyes, I got on the phone and it was Coach Coughlin. He said, Donovan, we're about to draft you. You're about to be a Jacksonville Jaguar. He said, how would you feel about that? I said, man, I'm so excited. I can't wait to start. And so at that moment back then, they would give the card to the commissioner. And then the commissioner would then on ESPN walk across the stands and put the card down. And then he would read and he would say, with the 25th pick of the 1998 draft, the Jacksonville Jaguars select Donovan Darius out of Syracuse, New York. And so when he said that, everybody in the house just went up in roars. I mean, cheers, cheers, everything. One of my brothers, man, they thought they were prophetic. Man, we knew you was getting drafted. Like, man, get out of here. You ain't know nothing. All of a sudden, you knew it was going to happen. But in the midst of those cheers, in the midst of those tears, I heard something in the back of my head. I heard a still small voice, and it said purpose. It was for this purpose that I allowed you to go through what you went through. It was for this purpose that I prepared the path. It was for this purpose that you went through the heartaches. It was for this purpose that you felt like giving up. It was for this purpose that you was out there working when nobody, nobody was there. It was for this purpose that you sacrificed. It was for this purpose that you kept going. When I heard that, it totally made sense. There's somebody in here that is having that draft day experience in your life where life is here to draft you, where you have to look back and say, every moment I went through was for this purpose so that you can hear this message. You can be empowered, encouraged, and inspired to understand that life is not happening to you. Life is happening for you and because of you. It's happening for you because God says everything, you know, everything is going to work together for your good. It's happening because of you because every decision and every moment, everything you decide to do changes the alters and trajectory of your life. And so for me, I understood lesson number one was that, guess what? We all have a journey. You're in your journey right now. 
And so that journey led me to a lifetime now of continuously being an inspiration and motivation to people, man. To help people maximize their potential. To get them connected so they can answer those five questions. I can't do it for you. But only you can do it. What Pastor Eric said, listen, yep, you got all the information. You're getting equipped and we're going to talk about that. But guess what? Now you got to execute. You got to execute. And so understand, I understood it. We all have a journey. The second lesson I learned is that we have to be equipped and we have to be prepared. We have to be equipped to be prepared. For every NFL game I went out for, before that game, that whole week, it was a lot of preparation. I would break down a team, like for example, t- tomorrow when Jaguars play. Before they line up, I already know, based off of the, who they have in the game, how many wide receivers, how many running backs, based off of where they're at on the, on, on the field, okay, in terms of what yard line, based off of, based off of when the quarterback snaps the ball in the, clock, the play clock, based off if there's motion or not, based off of how many guys over here, how many guys over there, I knew between three to five plays exactly what they was going to do. I was prepared. And see, in life, if you're not prepared, then you're not prepared for the opportunity. When the opportunity comes, you're not going to be able to maximize it. And so I learned, I learned real fast through my journey that you have to be equipped and you have to be prepared. And so being prepared has everything to do with, I'm going to give you a couple of things to think about. Number one, being prepared has to do with setting God-sized goals. God-sized goals. Because at the end of the day, God says to you, he says, eyes haven't seen, the ears haven't heard. He says, you know what? He said, whatever it is, he said, you know, that exceedingly and abundantly, more than you can ever ask dream or dare to imagine, he said, that's what I'm able to do for you. See, the problem is for most people is that they're not, they're not setting their goals too high. They're setting their goals too low and they're hitting them and they're making it. But God says, guess what? I want to stretch you. There's two attributes of God that everybody should walk around with and understand. And that is God is all about expanding and God is all about expressing himself. And he wants to expand by his kingdom message and his kingdom uh, culture, his kingdom values, his kingdom principles. And he wants to express himself through you. And so wherever you go, you're expressing who God is. And so number one, you got to be able to set those God-sized goals for this year. What is that in your family? What is that with your children? What is that on your job? What is that financially? What is that physically? What is that? Wherever it is right now, I want you to multiply by 10. Really stretch it. Your goals should scare you. You should say, there's no way in the world I can do it. And God's like, yep, now you're ready. Because with man, this is impossible. With God, all things is possible. And so understand, you have to have it. You have to have it. Because the Bible says, without a vision, the people perish. And cast all restraint. It didn't say without a vision, the people just get confused. It didn't say without a vision, the people just kind of slowly walk. No, it said the people perish. That means that they die. It may not be physically, but it can be mentally. It could be emotionally. It could be spiritually. They die because I don't have anything to work for. It's not big enough. The reason why, guys, this is one of the reasons why most people set goals now, resolutions, and they give up because it's not big enough. It hasn't inspired you enough. It hasn't inspired you enough. You already see what you can do. But it hasn't inspired you enough. And so set God-sized goals. The next thing that I had to learn when it comes to being prepared and being equipped is that you have to overcome and you have to conquer fear. You have to conquer the fear. 365 times in the Bible it says, fear not. Well, we know fear to be false evidence appearing real. Well, one of the reasons why God tells us not to fear because it comes back to a lack of trust but I'm gonna give you a strategy on how to overcome fear and how to conquer it. Number one, if you have any fear in your life, the first thing you need to do is discover it. You need to discover, where did this come from? Because for some people, they saw a movie when they were younger and it stuck with them. For somebody else, it was that their father or their mother or an aunt or uncle or somebody told them they couldn't do something or they had an experience when they were younger. Discover, where did it come from? First, after you discover where it come from, then you have to define it. This is what it is. I'm scared of heights, or I'm scared because I have fear of failure. I, fear of, I have a fear of succeeding. Like, am I good enough? I have a fear of rejection. Now you gotta define it. 
Because after you now define it, you can develop a plan. See, because when you develop a plan, think about your life. What's the last thing that you were nervous about doing? That when you develop a plan, you overcame it. That when you developed and you walked it out and you wrote it out and you determined, these are the steps. Like right now, if you say, well, I got a fear of being broke. I got a fear of being homeless. Guess what? Have you ever been homeless before? Or do you know somebody who was homeless? Have you ever lost a job before? If you lost a job before, what did you do? I processed it. This is what I did. I reached out to this person. Because once you develop a plan, you can do the last thing with fear. You can defeat it. But see, if you don't have a plan, if you haven't discovered it, if you haven't defined it, And if you haven't developed a plan, you can never defeat it. So this year in 2018, I want you to conquer fear. I want you to discover what am I afraid of? Because fear is your passport to your progress. That's all it is. When you think about what area of my life am I fearing in, that area, when you overcome it, is taking you to your destination. A person who's, amen. A person who's afraid to fly, watch, watch this. A person, okay, anybody here, anybody here has a reservation about flying? All right, amen. Watch this. In your life, you got dreams, you got goals on where you need to go. The answer to that is on the other side of that flight. So if I understand this, that I'm a, I have a fear of flying, and I understand that my fear is actually an indicator of my passport for progress, then that means that nobody else here to do this, I got to do this. I got to overcome this. I got to conquer this because when I get on that plane, it takes me to my next opportunity. It takes me to the next person that I need to talk to. It takes me to the answer. But as long as we're allowing fear to hold us back, as long as we're we're basically pushing it off to somebody else or for another day, then we're going to constantly be frustrated. And so understanding this, you got to have God's side goals, conquer your fear. Then you got to plan it out. God says in his word, he says, commit to him. He says, commit your plans to the Lord and they will succeed. Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it just to get money? Is it just to be known? What is it for? Because he says when you commit your plans to the Lord, then he said he'll establish them. Because God just wants you to know, listen, man, why are you here? Are you here to do what I purpose you to do? And here's what God purposed us to do. I love this scripture, and most people don't really understand it to the fullness. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says, And let us make mankind in our own image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the face of the earth, over the sea, over the animals, over everything. So the very purpose of that scripture says this. God says, let us make mankind, we are mankind, after his image and likeness with his ability. And let us do what? Have dominion, be in authority over the things over this earth. Not people, but the areas of gifting that he's given you. And so, very, so the very much understanding that, I understand that I'm here to dominate. I'm here to be an authority, not over people, but over the area that God has implanted, that he's built inside of you. And that's what he's given you. But he said, if you don't commit the plans to him, if your plans are only for you, then that means you're not here to do the things and the very reason why he created you. And so many people will be frustrated. Well, you're frustrated because your plans are not lining up with God. You're frustrated because you have, your plans are not fully developed in him. But he says, when you commit your plans to God, he says, you will succeed. And so the first lesson I learned is that you have a journey. The second lesson is you have to be equipped. The third lesson that I learned is you have to execute, man. You have to execute when it's game time. Every year, I, every year that I used to go to a game every Sunday, when I drove over that heart bridge, guess what? I didn't feel like playing. Can you believe that? Every Sunday in the NFL, I didn't feel like it. I might have been hurt. I might have been tired. You know what I'm saying? I might have been frustrated. Things in my family, things in my job, my teammates, my coaches. There's always the, all these different excuses. Listen, are you looking for an excuse reason why you could or why you can? And so every time I drove over that stadium, I didn't feel like playing. But I always had to execute. I always had to execute. And in order to execute, you have to understand that you have to practice. You have to train. You have to be disciplined. You don't just get it one time. It doesn't just happen because you do it one time. You have to master the techniques of what you're trying to do. You have to master it. You got to put hours and put hours in time because you got to be developed. Remember, hey, you're a high powered machine. God put everything in you. You're fully loaded. 
I think about it like this. I think about it like a manufacturer of a car, BMW. See, BMW makes cars to manufacture, and they put it, they make it fully loaded. They put the engine in it, the V8, V10, you know, V12. They put these powerful engines. They put leather seats. They have these powerful, powerful audio systems, tires, anti-lock brakes, fully loaded. And then they send that BMW car to the dealership. And when they send it to the dealership, what they do is they basically send it with a manual and they put a sheet on the window. And in that sheet, you see everything that's on the inside of that car. You see all the things, how fast it can get to zero to 60 in about two seconds, three seconds. But watch this, we come along, we go to the BMW dealership, we look at it, we jump into it. But if you're a 15 year old kid and you're driving that BMW with lack of experience, not being trained, you won't fully experience everything that that BMW has to offer. But if you have somebody that's in NASCAR or somebody from BMW, and they jump in there and they know how, they've been practicing, they know how to really maximize that BMW, then that person who's in there can get the full experience. There's a lot of us in life in here that we're walking around, we're fully loaded, but we're like that 15-year-old kid. We, ain't even, we, we haven't even practiced or understood or manifested all the things that you can do. But as you intentionally in practice, as you discipline yourself, as you go through spiritual disciplines, as you trust more, have faith more, walk in courage more, as you do those things, you'll see, wait a minute, I'm fully loaded. I'm fully loaded. God put everything in me that I need. He gave me creativity. He gave me the ability to perceive. He gave me the ability to reason. He gave me this intuition. He gave me a will. He gave me my memory. He gave me sight. Touch. He gave me all these things. But it's up to you to practice with it. It's up to you to bring it out. And so I understood that, that when you did and when I practiced, man, not only did I have to master my skills, I had to be uncomfortable. I had to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, fellas. Comfortable with being uncomfortable. So what I, one of the things I used to do, man, we had Jimmy Smith, which I think was one of the greatest receivers, man, that I ever played with and against. We had a guy by the name of Fred Taylor, man. Now listen, this guy, he can, he, you know, he can jump cut on a dime. And I, what I used to do in practice is I used to go against them. I wanted to get myself comfortable with being uncomfortable. I wanted to put myself in the toughest situations so that I can learn, that I can grow. Because nobody grows when it's comfortable. Like, I didn't go into the weight room. I didn't go into the weight room and never get stronger because I never lift weights. It was actually the weights. It was the adversity that came, that developed me. And so I needed that weight. I needed that situation. I had to make myself uncomfortable. Because one of the things that I learned that when, you, when it's time to execute, that my ability, you'll know you're ready when, to execute when you're able to teach somebody else. You see, I had 17 different free safeties that I had to play with, against. Well, I actually played with my teammates. And my job when they came on the team was to teach them, to walk with them, to help them. But I knew I was, t I was ready to execute in the game when I was able to teach anybody about what it is that we need to do. And so it's the same thing for you. In order for you to be equipped, in order for you ready for you to execute, you got to spend the time, gentlemen. You got to spend the time. You got to practice. It's mandatory. And so understanding that lesson number four that I learned as well is that you must embrace adversity. Don't run from it. Don't, you must embrace adversity. Don't run from it. God says, in this world, you will suffer tribulations. He told us that. He told us. How many people in here are trying to go through life without problems? Because God said, in this world, you're going you're gonna to experience tribulations. Because everything has a purpose to it. Here's, here's a quote that I love. Here's a quote that I love. It says, every adversity, every failure, every disappointment carries with it a seed of equal and greater opportunity for success. I want you guys to repeat it with me. I want you to repeat it with me. Every failure, every adversity, every setback carries with it a seed of equal a greater, greater opportunity, opportunity for, success. for success. Listen, gentlemen, that just basically means every adversity you've been through, every situation carries with it a seed. What are you doing with that seed? Where are you planting that seed? Because you can grow. You can grow when you plant that seed. One of the things that I learned in life is that, that there's three benefits to adversity. Three. 
Adversity comes to do three things. Adversity comes, number one, to teach you. It's coming to teach you that you need some more information. You need to do something different. It's teaching you. And so my question to you, are you learning the lessons that adversity is trying to teach you? Well, if I'm in school, if I keep failing the test, what I got to do with the test? Keep taking it over. So think about your life. What area of your life are you having to keep do over and over and over and over? Guess what it tells me? You haven't learned the lesson that this situation, that adversity, that life is trying to teach you. But once you learn the lesson, now it's trying to get promoted. Now it's time to move to the next chapter. And so adversity comes to teach you. Adversity then also comes to train you. It comes to train you. It comes to develop you. See, I never had a coach teach us a technique, show it to us one time, and I had it. That means I had to go out and practice it over and over and over and over and over. And I had to be trained in it. You have to be trained in your forgiveness. You got to be trained in your communication skill. You got to be trained in your will. You got to be trained in these areas. But here's where most people are afraid to do. They look at the adversity and they don't understand it's here to train them and they give up. Remember this, gentlemen, as I said earlier, God would never do for you what he only meant to do to you and through you. God will never do for you what he only meant to do through you. See, a lot of people are trying to say, God, come down and please do this. No, he's like, I put you there to do it. Oh, God, you know what I'm saying? I, I need another job. Well, guess what? How many applications have you applied for? How much skill set have you worked on? He's like, man, I need more money. Well, what are you doing to create more money? Are you using the gifts you have? Are you going from the inside? There's something that I wasn't even going to talk about. I'll just quickly share with you guys. How many of you guys in here want to make more money? All right, okay, granted. Because guess what? I mean, at the end of the day, the Bible says money, money answers to all things, okay? But guess what? All the resources belong to God. But again, sometimes we want to make more. But here's a law. Just like gravity is a law, the law, the law of gravity, whatever goes up must come where? Whatever goes up must come where? It's a law. We can trust it. I can stand on the top of a building and say, man, I don't believe that law today and walk off the building. But at the bottom of the thing, when I'm in a hospital or I'm dead somewhere, then guess what? I, will, I can't break the law. The law is going to break me. Well, here's a law for you. I want you to remember this. It's called the law of compensation. And I learned this while I was playing with the Jaguars. The law of compensation says this. You will earn in life in direct ratio to three things. That means you will get the amount of money that you need Okay, in direct ratio to these three things. Number one, the need that there is for what you do. Think about your job. Is there a need for what you do? Your service, your merchant, what you do, your product. Is there a need for it? Well, if so, you will earn in direct ratio just to the need, number one. The way you increase that is you will earn in exact ratio to, here's number two, your ability to do it. How good are you at doing what you do? Is there somebody right next to you that can do the same thing? the same way, or are you adding value to yourself so you can add value to others? Are you reading books? Are you watching videos? Are we using our phone to learn, to allow it to enhance us? Are we learning it, are we using it just to call people, to holler at them, to complain, to check on Facebook, to this, that, and the other? What are you using it for? Because the law of conversation says you will earn an exact ratio to your ability to do it. What are you doing to increase your skill set? What are you doing? Because I used to have a saying with the guys around my team. I said, listen, let your actions speak so loud, I don't have to hear a word that you say. Don't tell me you want to be better. Show me you want to be better. Don't tell me you want a better life with your wife. Show me you want a better life with your wife. Don't tell me you want to be a better father. Show me you want to be a better father. Don't tell me you want to be an all-pro player. Show me by the time and the work you put in. And so number one, you're earning an exact ratio to the need that there is. Number two, you're earning an exact ratio to your ability to do it. Number three, you are earning an exact ratio to the difficulty that there is in replacing you. My question to you, are you replaceable? Are you replaceable? That means are you so good at what you do that you're replaceable, irreplaceable, that they just can't get anybody to do it? In life, God says there are no duplications, it's only imitations. There'll never be another one of you. There'll never be another one. And so when I was with the Jaguars, 
my last three years, my last three years with the Jaguars, I was franchise tagged. And here's what the franchise tag says. It says we're going to have one, we can give one tag to one person on this team who we cannot afford to lose. Irreplaceable. They're going to give this tag to a person that they cannot afford to lose. And so that means to the Jaguars that they looked at me. Number one, is there a need for safety and a leader and a community advocate and a person that's going to try to walk, going to walk out, you know what I mean, represent his brand and everything together? Yes, there was. How good was it? How good was I? Well, was I the first one at the, at the practice facility and the last one? Did I watch study film? Did I was able to teach what it is I was able to do? Did I work hard? Did I prepare? Did I do those things? Yes, my ability to do it. And then how difficulty was there in replacing me? Could they just get anybody out there to just play, you know, strong safety? Oh, no. Oh, no, they couldn't do it. They couldn't play. They couldn't get anybody. So guess what they did? In one year, they paid me $3 million. The second year, they paid me $4 million. The next year, they paid me $5 million. I don't say that to impress you. I say that to impress upon you the point that, listen, when you become irreplaceable because you made a decision in your mind that I'm, going to, I'm not just going to talk about it, I'm going to be about it, and I'm going to do it. Yes. When your dream and your vision is big enough, not just for you, but for your legacy, not just in what you earn, but when that you learn and what you can share with others. It's when you do that, you become irreplaceable. It's when you do that, do you tap in to the potential that God has for you. See, I can see Jesus now when we all pass, when you pass away and you're standing before him. He's like, God, I was waiting for you. He's going to turn around and say, I was waiting for you. I needed you. He was like, no, 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 I needed you. He said, I wasn't coming back to earth to do it. He said, I already did everything so that you can do it. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? See, one of the things I always say, I said, listen, man, I hate religion. I love relationship. Religion is about, a lot of times in me, for me, I felt like the greatest thing that ever happened to me is when I got delivered from religion to relationship. Because, because religion says, religion says that I got to do all these things. Relationship says that I already did this thing. Religion says that I'm begging, hoping to get something. Kingdom and relationship says I already did it and it's here for you. Religion says one day it may happen for me. The kingdom of God and relationship says today is the day. Now is the moment of your decision. And so when we understand that, when we understand that, we walk in a power. We walk in a confidence. It's not arrogance. Arrogance is me comparing myself. Confidence is me accepting myself and being able to answer those questions. You have to answer those questions in your life. And so the third thing that adversity does, it teaches you, it trains you, then it tests you. It tests you how bad do you really want it. What are you going to do when the situation comes? What are you going to do when you put all your ducks in a row and it comes out and all of a sudden you see nothing in front of you? What are you going to do when you look at the bank account and it says less than what you thought? What are you going to do when you get rejected? What are you going to do when you make calls? What are you going to do when you do everything when you tried it three times and you feel like you're ready to give up? Because in the NFL, there's three seasons. There's a, there's a preseason, regular season, and there's a postseason. During the preseason, you get tested. During the preseason, it's hot. During the preseason, you feel like giving up. During the preseason, every part of your body hurts. And during the preseason, there's 100 guys. But the purpose of the preseason is to test the guys to see who really wants it and who's good enough. Who's willing to go through the tests and the trials and who's willing to stay on long enough. Because after the preseason, the regular season comes. And they cut that list from 100 to 53 guys. So that basically means that 47 other guys did not make the cut. Some of them didn't make the cut because they gave up. Some of them didn't make the cut because they just thought it was too hard. Some of them didn't make the cut because, guess what, they wasn't good enough in that skill. But I'm asking you today, in the life that you're going through, will you make the regular season? Can you make the cut? Are you allowing adversity to teach you, to train you, and then to test you? Because that's ultimately what it's come for. And so remember this, you guys, the lessons that I learned, you guys, and here's the last one. Okay, I learned the first one that, guess what, we all have a journey. Number two, that, that you have to be equipped and prepared. Number three, also learned that you have to execute when game time, despite how you feel. 
And then number four, you must embrace adversity and not run from it. And the last one that I want to share with you guys is that you were created to excel and dominate. See, here's something I want you to read and listen to it. Conquer we shall. It's a quote. Conquer we shall. But first we must contend. It's not to fight that crowns us. It's not the fight that crowns us, but the one who's standing in the end. You see, we're all going to go through a fight. This life right now, you may be fighting something now. Mentally, emotionally, financially, physically, spiritually. It's not the fight that defines us. It's not the fight that crowns us. But it's the one who's standing in the end. See, life is seasonal. Life is seasonal. It keeps coming. And so I like, for example, I don't care how cold it is in the wintertime. You don't throw your summer clothes away. Because you know that springtime is coming. And then summertime is coming. My encouragement to you is if you find yourself in a period of time where you're in drought in wintertime in your life, things are tough, things are hard, things are dried up, then find out what do I need to do to make it through this, through this season. And keep going. Because you were created to dominate. God says in his word, he says, he says, the plans that I have for you are only good. They're only to bless you. They're only to give you a great future. God says, I'm going to watch over my word to perform it. What word are you holding on for your life? What whole word are you holding on for your mental? I have the mind of Christ. What are you holding for your physical? By his stripes I was healed. What are you holding for, his finance, for your financial? He says, God will supply all my needs according to my riches and, riches and glory. What are you holding for for your vision? God says, whatever you set before him, he's going, you, you establish the plans, he's going, to make it, he's going to make it prosper and establish the way. What is the word that you're holding for? Because God says, watch this. He says, I'm watching over my word to perform it. What are you declaring over your life? How many times are you saying, I can, I can, I can? No, 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 no. I can do all things. I can do all things. Because when you declare it, God watches over to perform it. I conquered what I did in life. And it's, I want to leave, finish with you guys with a story. How all this stuff came to pass for me and how it all made sense. It was a story. I remember when uh, a moment when I got drafted, actually 1998, my first year as a rookie at the Jacksonville Jaguar. We played, the, Dragon, the Jaguars drafted me because we used to play in a division, the AFC Central at the time. And in this division, we had some big running backs, fellas. We had some big running backs. We had Corey Dillon. He was 6'1", 230 pounds. We had Eddie George, 6'4", 245, just a gladiator. We had Jerome Bettis, 6'3", 270 pounds. This division was a beast. And so they drafted me out of Syracuse. And when they drafted me, they said, you know, we need somebody that's going to be able to stand the test. We need somebody that's going to be able to come and stop the run. And so I'll never forget, it was, it was November 22nd, 1998. We go up to Three Rivers Stadium to play against the Pittsburgh Steelers. And Pittsburgh Steelers used to have this, they used to have this guy on their team. And this guy was so good, he had a nickname, this running back, number 36. Anybody know his nickname was? He was the what? Oh. He was the what? All right, you know, guess what? We about to go up to Steelers tomorrow, right? And you know what I'm saying? We about to, we about to wax that tomorrow, right? <laughs> any, 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 any Steelers? Hold on real quick. Any Steelers fans in here? Any Steelers fans? All right, listen, we're about to do an Oklahoma drill right now. You're going to be up here. I'm going to go against you. All right. We just going to make it really happen here. But here's the thing, man. Listen, November 26th, November, uh, November 22nd, 1998, I'm up there in my rookie year. And they got this running back. In the first half, man, this cat was so good, they gave him a nickname. His nickname was The Bus. And you know what The Bus does to kids every morning? It takes people around the school. And so cats like me, running back, I mean, safeties, would get on the guy, and he would just carry him all around the field. He was a beast. So the first half, we get up there, man, them terrible towels are flying, and they're like, yeah. And you can just hear him going, and like, okay, first half, we're playing against him. And he's in beast mode. I mean, he's doing everything. I mean, he's breaking tackles, boom, boom. He's doing Heisman poses, hey. He's doing all this stuff. And I'm like, man, this is my first year. Something got to change. And so I go into the locker room. And as I'm sitting on my stool, I'm sitting there and saying, something got to change. I wasn't created for this. I was created to dominate. I was created to, to put my mark and my stamp and to leave my name and my brand on this field today. And this thing starts with me. So as I'm sitting on my chair, 
I'm listening and looking around the locker room. Remember, this is a first year for me. So a lot of times you may be going into something for the first time and thinking because other people have been doing it longer than you that they got the answer figured out. But here's what I hear. Oh, man, here's what I hear from the other guys. Coach called the wrong play. Oh, man, he missed his block. Oh, man, he missed the tackle. Complaining, complaining, complaining. That ain't the mind of Christ. That's a bad attitude. You want to know a bad attitude? Listen to him. Anybody that's complaining? <laughs> bad attitude. But what I did while I was sitting there, and I said, something got to change. And I just felt empowered by being able to answer those questions. This starts with me. As I heard a voice in the back of my head, and like I told you earlier, God speaks. And it says, Donovan, the person that's going to make a change is you. And so while I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, the person that's going to make a change is me? I'm just a rookie. I'm just 6'1", 220 pounds. I'm only 4'4", 240 yard dash guy. It's more of them out there than it is of me. The guys on my team are just running around complaining, but it starts with me. I can change this. You may be asking yourself, you may be saying to yourself, I can change this. I can change my life situation. I can change my financial situation. I can change the generational situation that my family I went through. I can be that one. And so as I was sitting there, I heard that. The person that makes a change is you. So I got up from my chair. I went in the bathroom. I put my helmet on the, on the counter. And I looked myself in the mirror. And I said, Donovan, it's about to go down. <laughs> Grabbed my helmet. We went out for the second half, man. First play, first play of the second half. Matter of fact, first play of the second half, we line up. They line up in three by one set. Cordell Stewart was the center. And Cordell Stewart was lining up. Jerome Bettis was seven yards deep, okay, behind Cordell Stewart. I'm in my stands. And all while I'm in my stands, I am saying this to myself. That's why when the Bible says David encouraged himself, you got to speak to yourself. And so as I'm sitting there, as I'm in my stands, it starts with me. I was purposed for this. I was born for this. This is my moment. But only I can do it. Only I can make myself go. And so as I'm in my stand, and Cordell Stewart on the other side, okay? Cordell Stewart, he's, he's doing a cadence. He's like, green 80, green 80. I said, hut, hut, hut. Snaps the ball, hands to Jerome Bettis. Before the snap, I'm in my stands. Jerome Bettis is seven yards deep behind a quarterback, and this is what I hear. <sighs> I'm in my stands on the other side like, yo, is this dude growling out here? It's a football game. But guess what? There's some times in your life that your problems, your situations seem like they're growling. Sometimes it seems like they're so loud. You just want them to shut up. But it's up to you to shut them up. So I'm in my stands. I'm in my stands and I'm going through. And he snapped the ball. And after I take my read steps, I'm now coming down. And so as I'm coming down, he handed the ball to the left. So watch this. Do me a favor. You guys are going to be Jerome Bettis right now. So do me a favor. Lean to the left. Everybody lean to the left. Everybody lean to the left. So in my stands, I take my read steps. And all I see, it's run. I see everything that I, that I studied to see it. And I'm coming down. And with, stay over there. He didn't cut back. Stay over there. <laughs> And with every step, I'm thinking, it starts with me. With every step, I'm thinking, I'm here to dominate. With every step, I'm saying, it starts, it, you know what I mean? It's only me that can do it. With every step, he's going to feel me today. And at the last moment, when I got there, I set my feet, boom! I hit this joker, man, so hard, man, and setting back. Matter of fact, this video is on YouTube, so you can go watch it, okay? Down in the football highlights, so make sure you watch it. You guys can sit up now. So listen, I hit this joker so hard, the first time that the bus stopped. The bus stopped that day. I got up from there. Amen. Amen. I got up from there and I stood over top like, yeah! I didn't get a flag. I didn't get a penalty for taunting. But I was excited. Why? Was it because I didn't have fear? No. Was it, was it, was it was because there wasn't doubt? No. You see, courage is not what you do in the absence of doubt and fear. Courage is the step you take in the presence of fear. And so what was it? Why was I a little excited? Because that was my moment. Life had drafted me. Life had called me. Life was teaching me lessons. But I had to be willing to learn it. And I had to be willing to walk it out. And so after that moment, after he got up and his jersey was all twisted, helmet all twisted, and he, like, he was like, you didn't hit hard. I'm like, yeah, you felt me, buddy. You felt me. I know you felt me. 
every time we played after that. And he's a Hall of Famer for a reason, because he's one of the greatest running backs I ever went against. He brought out the best in me. We would always meet up before the games and say, hey, buddy, hey, let's have a great game, man. Let's do it today. Because he, brought, he allowed me to help maximize my potential. He stretched me. He allowed me to bring out my best. I'm here today because I want to stretch you. I want to challenge you. You haven't, even tapped your, you haven't even tapped to scratch the surface. I don't care how old you are. We were never meant to retire. Never meant to retire. We was only meant to keep going and keep going and keep going. And on the last breath, now it's time to retire. Now it's time to rest. And so I don't care where you're at today. I came here to challenge you guys. I came here to empower you. I came here to let you know that in life, you all have a journey. In life, you have to be equipped and you have to be prepared. In life, you have to be willing to be, be ready to execute at any moment. And in life, you have to embrace, you have to embrace adversity. And in life, you got to understand that you're created to dominate and created to excel. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> These messages that you hear, you can only hear them once. You can't come today and say, I got it. See, my job is to inspire you. I can't motivate you. Motivation has everything with the root word motion. You're the only one that can put yourself in motion. What I can do is I can inspire you. And inspire you is igniting the spirit on the inside of you to now do what you need to do, to study, to discipline yourself, to take it one day at a time to watch this video over and over, to keep reminding yourself, to keep telling yourself, to keep writing your goals. You know, every day I write my goals down two times a day, in the morning and at night. I write them down every day, two times a day. Why? In the morning, it sets my course. At night, life happened. Some things may not have went my way, so I got to write it down again to remind myself, where am I going? In the morning and at night. If you're serious about it, write them down. If you really want to go there, write them down. Watch this video. Remind yourself. I'm not here for money. I'm not here for fame. I'm here because I found my purpose. And I'm walking in it. And by the grace of God, he's allowed me to connect with you. He's allowed me to speak to you, to give you the message, and the message that you need at this moment for today. Yesterday is, a his Yesterday is history. Tomorrow's a mystery. Today is a present because it's a gift from God. Maximize your day. Amen. Give yourself a round of applause. Didn't you do a great job? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hey, before we go, I'd like to give you some next steps to just put this message we heard into practice, put it into action in our everyday lives. If you enjoyed what you heard today, stop by there, grab the book, read it, keep it going in your life. We have 20 different groups back there. I want to encourage you that if you're not plugged into a small group or maybe you're ready to lead a group, there's even an opportunity to do that back there. Don't just walk out of here. Take that next step to get plug it, plugged in and engaged. If you don't have a home church, stop by our next step station. We'll help get you connected. We'll help you get plugged in. If you want to go to that conference, go back there and get more information about Iron Sharpens Iron. Let me pray for us today. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful time that we had from the breakfast to the worship to the word lord god you have been present you have used this as a moment to encourage our hearts encourage our minds lord i know that there's a variety of different people in here at various stages of life for those who are struggling we pray that they would feel your presence that you would lift them up that this message would encourage them to make some change in their life that is empowered by your holy spirit for those who need to get connected, who need to get engaged, Lord God, would they plug in? Would they do? And your word says that we are blessed in the doing, Lord God. We've attempted to equip them today. Would they put this word into practice? For those who are ready to lead, Lord, would you use them to touch and influence the rest of us, that we could all grow together to be fully devoted followers of you? We love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. You are our king. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you guys. Stay on the lookout for more Man Church events. Get plugged into a group. 
Have a great day, everybody.